Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. A new report from the London-based Carbon Tracker Initiative titled The U.S. Coal Crash, Evidence for Structural Change, says that the American coal industry is in trouble and that the future doesn't look any better for the industry. Is this the future of what's to come for all fossil fuels? Or is dirty coal energy source merely being replaced by another? With us to discuss the report is one of its authors from London, England, is Luke Sussums. Luke is senior researcher at Carbon Tracker Initiative. He leads work on the coal sector. He also co-authors reports on stranded assets and wasted capital in fossil fuel industry. Thank you so much for joining us, Luke. Thank you for having me. Look, let's take a look at your report. Give us the broad strokes in terms of the findings that people must know. Well, this report uh, analyzes what has been a pretty rapid decline in the U.S. coal sector and some of the drivers that have underpinned uh, that transition. Now, in particular, the report concludes that the emergence of cheap shale gas um, the price of gas has, in fact, fallen 80 percent since 2008. The emergence of cheap shale gas substituting for coal and um, the role that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the regulations that it has brought in to uh, tackle pollution on a number of different levels has both served to constrain U.S. demand for coal. Now, we like to think of it as almost a one-two punch. The gas industry took the legs out from underneath the U.S. coal sector and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency regulations have made it very, very difficult for the sector to recover. Now, we think that this shift is structural in nature. Rather than being a cyclical change in which an upturn may um, come about relatively soon, we think these are structural shifts and therefore um, the U.S. coal industry could see a slow um, decline over the next few years. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, were reported by some other sources is that while the use of uh, coal in the United States has gone down, uh, production actually has not been reduced, and in fact, it's shifting to exporting coal. I, has that, did you factor that in in your report? It's, it's certainly something that we looked at, but the, the data suggests that that isn't happening. Um, the US EIA, which is the leading source of, of coal data in the US, actually suggests that over 250 coal mines closed between 2011 and 2013. Now, that suggests that production is lowering in the US, but certainly you're right in saying that a number of the U.S. producers were planning on exporting a lot of this product, which was no longer demanded in, uh, in the U.S. domestically. However, in the report, we suggest that perhaps there aren't as many prosperous end markets for that product. Um, China has seen its coal consumption actually decline this year for the first time since, two, since the turn of the century. That is a major, major shift, considering as a country that consumes half of the world's coal. We are seeing um, similar downside demand factors occurring in India. So we think actually the seaborne trade market isn't actually as, as prosperous as a lot of these U.S. producers believe it could be. Um, so your report supports the evidence that this is now a lot of the cold infrastructure is stranded assets. Mm. Yeah, stranded assets is a concept that we've focused on since our inception here at the Carbon Tracker Initiative. Um, and this essentially res relates to assets which, which don't actually deliver the return expected of them when the investment was made, when the inv investment decision point was, was made. And yeah, we're certainly seeing, with regards to the um, coal mine closures that I mentioned earlier, but also that it's, it's occurring in the utility sector. Um, since 2010, 14 gigawatts of U.S. coal plants have, in fact, retired early. Um, and we consider this to be a trend that will continue. Big investment banks, such as Deutsche Bank, actually forecast that the amount of coal plants that could retire by 2030 could be as much as 92 gigawatts. Now, this is huge amounts of stranded assets that will be passed on to the investors, investors in these companies who will suffer significant value destruction as a result. 
And um, as far as the report is concerned, um, you stated that the Dow Jones total market uh, coal sector index is down 76 percent over the last five years mm -hmm. compared to the Dow Jones industrial average that is up uh, 69 percent mm -hmm. over the same period. Mm -hmm. So you also say that one of the drivers is the increased use of shale gas. So is it a matter of replacing one greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuel with another? Well, I guess that depends on your standpoint on whether or not gas and shale gas in particular is an effective transition fuel. Now, it's clearly a very politically sensitive topic and, and one which is debated heavily both in academia and in and policy making as to whether or not shale gas actually has climate benefits in terms of lower greenhouse gas emissions than coal. Now, we haven't yet looked at that in car at Carbon Tracker and we don't actually touch on that point in the report. But if you manage to keep fugitive emissions under control, it is undeniable that burning gas is about 50 percent lower in terms of its carbon intensity than burning coal. Now, when you look at uh, certain predictions in terms of the growth of the oil sector, uh, so reports are still uh, saying that the coal sector is expected to grow. What's your response to that? Again, I mean, it, it really depends on your opinion on what will happen in non-OECD countries. Now, coal consumption within OECD countries is already declining. So that means that the future of the coal industry really is relying on a few big, major non-OECD emerging markets. And I mentioned China, which is already beginning to decline its coal consumption, which is an unparalleled shift compared to the levels of growth they've been experiencing over the last 10 years. But then if you also take India out of the equation, as they try and actually um, source a lot more of their demand domestically with their own production, they recently announced that they plan to cut imports of coal to zero within the next three years. Now that spells big problems for major coal exporters such as the US, but also Indonesia and Australia, and should serve as a, um, as a warning to investors in those companies. Right. And um, let's uh, turn to the political situation here in the United States. The Republican majority in the U.S. House and Senate have called Obama stricter regulations on coal burning uh, plants a war on coal. And for those who work in the coal industry and in places like West Virginia and Kentucky, where, you know, the heart of uh, coal production in the United States, who's relied on this uh, sector for um, livelihood and survival, um, is there a, um, a plan, I guess, in the environmental movement for transitioning these uh, workers from um, fossil fuel industries, or in this case, coal to clean energy? It's a, it's a good question. I mean, jobs will obviously be created from the growth markets that result from this energy transition and the transition to a lower carbon economy. Now, with regards to Obama's regulations, they, they, it's proven that they will deliver significant health, environmental, and climactic uh, benefits. For example, the clean power plan that was most recently announced, which rules the, or proposes that uh, U.S. coal um, existing coal plants have to reduce their emissions by 30 percent. That's estimated to deliver 55 to 93 billion dollars of climatic, environmental, and health benefits by 2020 alone. Now, I think it's clear to see from those numbers the motivation behind the introduction of these U.S. Um, EPA regulations. All right. I thank you so much for joining us today, Luke. Um, and we look forward to ongoing reports from uh, Carbon Tracker. Thank you very much. Thanks. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.